in a relaxed, you can sit in a relaxed way and smile to our breathing. Respected Thai, dear noble community, welcome to the twelfth class of this uh, course on uh, collective awakening, mindfulness, uh, Thai's mi mindfulness, Thai's vision for mindfulness and public health. <coughs> and today we're looking into Thai's vision for mindfulness and education. So we have the book Happy Teachers Change the World. And so we'll look into uh, the Applied Ethics Initiative and the uh, Wake Up Schools movement, and specifically how we are continuing to realize that vision with uh, bringing Plum Village practice into schools so that uh, teachers, first of all, and then their students and their colleagues can experience more peace and joy and bring it to their whole school. <laughs> so the last uh, talk that Tai gave using his voice <laughs> was at a teacher's retreat in France at Plum Village. And it may be that Tai had had the mini stroke already. It was October of 2014. And, and the, the retreat was for French teachers. So Tai spoke in French. And Tai was in a wheelchair. <laughs> and I remember um, Tai asked the one brother to get up and write on the board this uh, a circle with an arrow pointing in. And I said, the way out is in. And I said, if a teacher knows how to come back to themselves, take care of their emotions, then their, their partner will also know how to do it. and their children. And they can teach their colleagues and their students. They wanted to draw every circle <laughs> to show how it emanated outwards. And when I look at it, I think of the, the image of the candles that we learn that the individual candle has a flame and when you put another candle there, the light from the first candle blends with the light of the second candle. And if you add another one and another one and the collective light is, uh, increases and yet we can still perceive the light of each flame. 
that is a, a way to understand the individual consciousness and the collective consciousness. And so when, when Tai would draw this uh, circle coming the way out is in, coming back to oneself, we support our loved one to come back to themselves, our children, our colleagues, our students, and it emanates outwards. And uh, when one of our students suffers, then they know where they can take refuge. There's someone who is coming back to themselves, taking care of their emotions. And the, even if their flame becomes very weak, they can get new fuel, new energy from uh, the, the teacher, the family. And so the, the awakening is uh, growing like a collective light. This sounds very beautiful, but I, we've seen it put into practice in the past 10 or 15 years since I started this movement. We've done so many retreats for educators and we focus just on the practice of the educator. A lot of teachers come and they expect to learn how to teach mindfulness, but they're quite surprised when they come and they realize they have a lot of suffering and they haven't taken care, for example, of the child, the five-year-old child within themselves. And so, on the, so they come to get training to teach mindfulness and they leave realizing that the work of transformation has to happen first inside. And then when they touch that transformation, they go back to their school and they might just sit with a child that has a lot of uh, difficulty, is very acting up, and just hold that child's hand for f five breaths. And the child calms down. They don't have to say anything. They just sit and hold the child's hand. This is what was reported to us. This is just one example. And then other teachers observed that that child was not so anxious, was not, was not acting up so much in class anymore. So then they came to that teacher and they said, well, how, how did you do that? And so the teacher shared the practice with them. The teacher didn't have to go out and teach a seminar. They didn't have to bring Plum Village monks and nuns to do an intervention. They just sat and held the hand of one child. That caused so much difficulty for the teachers. And that child learned to breathe for five breaths. So when a strong emotion came up, they could remember that moment sitting there with the teacher and they could remember the five breath practice. And so slowly that teacher started a sangha. This is in a school in Michigan. And the administrators at that school they said, that's our teacher. It's like they had a, a secret. A teacher who learned how to help students transform their difficult emotions. And she didn't say anything about wake-up schools. She didn't say this is a Plum Village practice. There was no um, official certification <laughs> that she had as a happy teacher or anything. She just learned how to be there for the students and sit with them. And the, the, the school took ownership of that teacher, in a sense. They said, oh, this is one of ours. One of our teachers is doing this magical thing in our school. And so the, slowly, more and more teachers wanted to learn, and they started to come together and eat mindfully together once a week for lunch. And they would ask questions. And when they saw the freshness and the happiness in that teacher, then they felt confident. And it was not imposed upon them as a program, but it came from their own eyewitness account of the situation. And that is the spirit with which Wake Up Schools has grown. 
And now we don't even know sometimes. I was contacted recently by a school in the Bay Area uh, called Synapse. And uh, a friend of mine, my, my roommate from college, my first year in college, his son went to that school. And uh, they had decided to, every year, the school, it's a exp very expensive private school, and uh, many tech CEOs and their kids there, and this kind of thing, Silicon Valley types. And, uh, and each year they have a, um, I think they call it bridge maker of the year. One, one person the, the school picks for the entire year for everyone to learn uh, from. And they pick Thai for this school year. And they, so they, my friend reached out to me. He said, do you know like, where my son went to school? Like, he, just, he doesn't understand why I'm a Buddhist monk. <laughs> I mean, a little bit maybe. But <laughs> he didn't understand why he works in financial equity. And so he, he said, oh, I know your teacher. He's picked as the entire school, has picked him to study for the, for the year as an inspiring figure. And so uh, we got in contact with them. And one of the administrators at that school is coming for the holiday retreat. And we will go there and, and share about Tai's life. And I said, "Did you have you seen this book, Happy Teacher?" They said, "Of course, we have that book. <laughs> Our teachers are studying it." And so, slowly like that, this it happens in a quiet way. Um, that's the spirit of um, the Plum Village practice in general, and Wake Up Schools in particular. We saw we're not going to go in, you know get schools certified as wake-up schools <laughs> and have this official program because then what happens, what we noticed happened in the early years of this uh, movement that the book describes is that the, many teachers would be very happy to have the monks and nuns come for a week, whether we went to a school in India or um, in England and uh, but there are always some teachers who felt, you know, somehow there's that feeling like, even it's really wonderful, but you feel like it's being imposed on you by the administrators. When you come to a retreat, you choose. Or maybe your loved one twists your arm a little bit. <laughs> but you have some say in the matter. And so I learned to have a lot of compassion for teachers who get so much training throughout their professional life. They, they're to give their whole heart and, and they also have to continuously learn new things. And sometimes they're not happy to do that. <laughs> but they just do it because they need to do it to keep their job. And so I realized I don't want to put a teacher in that situation. And so in the past uh, eight or nine years, Wake Up Schools has focused on educators' retreats where teachers come voluntarily. Many times their school supports them to come so they can just practice for themselves first. Just touch healing and transformation in themselves first, this, this spirit. And then they can go back and they know the culture of the school much better than we do. So they know, you know as Tai says in the the letter to a young teacher in the beginning of the book. I'll read it a little bit. They know how to build a community in the school. I said, let's dream about building a community among the colleagues and personnel of our institution. There must be two, three, or four people with whom you can commun communicate better, right? You should talk with them first about the happiness and suffering you see in yourself and in your school. 
So you, you know there are people, there's a circle of trust. And we encourage the teachers, rather than try to you know, be an evangelist <laughs> and go back and try to convert the whole school to mindfulness practice in the Plum Village way, but just to find two or three or four people that you, you know well, you, that you trust. And they see your freshness. They said, these people will see your transformation and healing. You are fresh, compassionate, and smiling. You can talk with them and get together more often with them to be able to continue the practice, not only on your own as, or as a family, but as a community. Building a community of practice is absolutely necessary. You can do walking meditation together, drink tea together, have a session of total relaxation together, and by doing so, create a small community consisting of happy teachers. So, we have a, now we do have a training program for teachers, the Happy Teachers Training Program. Sometimes it was called Level 2 of Wake Up Schools. Level 1 is you go to a retreat. In Level 2, you do a year-long uh, study of the Happy Teachers book as a teacher, and you start to learn the practices, and then bring them into your classroom, share them with your colleagues. And then at the end of that period, you become a happy teacher. <laughs> you may be a happy teacher before. <laughs> But we have a little ceremony, and, and that has continued now. And now we have a community of happy teachers around the world, in Vietnam, in the US, in France, in the UK, in Ireland, in Spain. We've gone to do retreats for teachers in Uganda, um, for about 250 teachers there. I hope we can go back. I heard it's very difficult. It's been very difficult there during the pandemic. Um, many, many schools closed completely and the students could not continue to study. So I think a lot about the teachers that we met and worked with there. And uh, in Singapore, in India. So slowly we're building this community of happy teachers around the world. That's the movement. <laughs> And uh, there's something very inspiring about working with teachers. They're kind of everyday heroes, real bodhisattvas, because the teachers, they don't teach for money. <laughs> there's gotta be something else that drives you to be a teacher. For me, I, I call it love. There's some kind of love in our heart that we received from our teachers and we want to transmit that. And uh, we might do it, for some of us, it might not be the format of a school. We become monks and nuns. <laughs> we receive the love of our teacher, and then we, we want to share it. Mm. But uh, I, I can't say that I've met a teacher out there that is doing it for the profit, <laughs> for the money. There really is some kind of love there, even if it comes out in ways that are not so skillful. So I found in these past, uh, what, 12 years, since we started doing retreats for educators, really, so inspired. I don't know why, but every time there's a retreat for educators, I just want to go there. <laughs> I want to be part of it. And it's not to, you know, to, uh, yeah, it's just because being with teachers, you feel... This, you, f you know that there's a kind of flame of the bodhisattva path in their heart. And that sometimes it's just been kind of grown over by weeds and um, maybe concrete blocks have been <laughs> laid on top of that. And they've lost their original joy. And so all we need to do is just allow them to breathe mindfully, to practice stopping, walking meditation, eating meditation together, and connecting with all the other teachers on the retreat. And suddenly those, that concrete block is removed. 
and the weeds kind of clear are cleared away and the beautiful flowers and the joy can come out again. And many teachers were just at the point of leaving their profession when they came on one of our educators' retreats. And somehow that retreat has rekindled the joy of teaching and they saw there was a way for themselves forward. So it's so beautiful to see that. <laughs> How many of you are teachers? Okay, a few of you. A few of you. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of you here for the three-month retreat, you're on career hiatus. So <laughs> but I think you all will be teachers someday. Uh, Dhamma teachers or uh, whatever it may be, whatever form it may take. And uh, yeah, somehow finding this path it gives a, a new life to what is possible as a teacher. Maybe we can listen to a bell. In a retreat that's uh, a teaching transcribed in the book, Tai tells the story of Henri. Henri was a professor of mathematics in the French school of Toronto, who after having spent three weeks in Plum Village, went back to his school and practiced mindfulness with his students. He walked slowly and mindfully into the class and began to write on the blackboard mindfully. His students asked him, Dear teacher, are you sick? He said, No, I am not sick. I am just practicing mindful walking. I enjoy it. I feel a lot of peace. I am very much at peace because I have learned mindfulness. Would you like me to tell you what I did in Plum Village? And they listened. They agreed that every 15 minutes, a boy would clap his hands because they did not yet have a bell of mindfulness. And everyone, including the teacher, would practice mindful breathing and relax as they sat together. They practiced stopping what they were doing and coming back to themselves in that moment by bringing all their attention to their in-breath and out-breath. This helped them to improve their capacity to learn in the classroom. In the beginning, it was like playing a game, but the more they did it, the more it became part of their everyday lives. The whole class profited greatly from the practice of mindfulness of breathing and sitting. Transformation and healing took place, and his class made a lot of progress, becoming a very joyful kind of family. Other classes at the school followed their example. And when Henri reached the age of retirement, the administration asked him to stay for a few more years. He could focus on bringing the practice of mindfulness into the school and improve the quality of teaching and learning. Henri's experience is possible. Just by sitting and breathing for a school teacher to help their students to suffer less and to be happy. You help them to generate a feeling of joy and then later they will know how to create a feeling of joy by themselves. So this is a, just one of the many stories that are in this book. And I, I really, you know, I think if you're not a teacher, you think, oh, why do I have to read this book? How many of you read this book? Oh. Excellent. Okay, some of you. <laughs> it's so much fun reading the stories from teachers, right? Yeah. 
like it's so there's so many um, testimonies from teachers who, uh, as we assembled this book, wrote to us and told us about how they were getting this kind of transformation in themselves and in the classroom. So the the principle of wake up schools is threefold. We call them the pillars of wake up schools. Thanks. So the first is embodiment. So teaching mindfulness is not just uh, to give the students a tool. Mindfulness is a path, it's a way. And as a teacher, we need to embody mindfulness. We don't need to be perfect. I mean, if you live here with the monks and the nuns, you know we are not perfect. (laughs) We make a lot of mistakes. But we are sincere in our practice of mindfulness. So we want to... We're on the path. That's clear. And so as a teacher, we also have to be on the path. We can't just uh, teach the techniques from the book and then expect the students to learn. I remember years ago at Deer Park when I was a novice, there was a group that came um, and... uh, Yeah, the teacher who brought, it was wonderful because the, te- the students got exposed to mindfulness practice. But the teacher was, um, loved Deer Park, but sometimes um, had an interesting way of practicing mindfulness. <laughs> she would go to the students and say, breathe, breathe, you have to breathe. <laughs> and the students, oh, ah. <laughs> and sometimes then she would go out and smoke a cigarette and, So it was wonderful because she brought the students here. She felt there was something very meaningful here, but she also you know, had some way on her own path, I think, to practice. And so sometimes the communication was not um, perfect between the monks, the monastics, and the teacher who came. And so that's uh, an example. It's, we cannot force people to do the practice. We only can inspire. And we inspire through embodying the practice. And it's not only embodying the practice, but also embodying transformation and healing. So just like the Henri in the class, when the students see him come back and he's walking very slowly to the board, uh, there's this something that's transmitted. It's not a teaching in the sense in which the students are used to receiving knowledge. It's our actual behavior which is transmitted. And the students know. They're very insightful. It's like kids. They know. They feel the energy. And something's not quite right. So kids are like a mirror. They can reflect our own difficulties and suffering. So this is the first point. We have to embody the practice. as teachers. And the second point is service. So we teach mindfulness not in the spirit of getting, uh, benefiting ourselves only, like making a profit or as a business. The spirit in which we teach as teachers is to serve. We're bringing about this collective awakening 
And so it's a joy for us to teach mindfulness. And that is compensation in itself. We don't need to make, uh, make uh, a lot of money doing it. So in the Wake Up Schools program, that's why when we train teachers in the Happy Teachers program, they have to already be working teachers. It means that they're a math teacher, or they could be a yoga teacher, they could be anything, but they are working as a teacher. It's not a training program to become a teacher, because that is a, the, usually the temptation people want to get certification in mindfulness as a teacher, and then they go out and make a living off of it. So the spirit of Wake Up Schools um, has been to really stick to people who are already teaching and they want to find a way to bring more peace and happiness into their lives and into the lives of their students. Mm -hmm. So it's not a mindfulness teacher training program. Of course, uh, there's a place for that. Um, uh, but we've also seen in experience how that can become a kind of business very quickly. So we have to be very, very, uh, very clear that the path of wake-up schools is the path of service. So we do it uh, for the transformation of ourselves and others in society. That is the spirit of wake-up schools and the second pillar. And the third is uh, community. We don't do it alone. We do it as a Sangha. And you can see, if you look deeply, you see the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha <laughs> in the three pillars. <laughs> if you have eyes, eyes of signlessness. <laughs> so community is a key. We don't do it alone. But we do it always in the spirit of community. And if we don't have a community, we can build community right away. And as a teacher, the, the best happiness we can experience is that we can just sit back and let our students uh, teach or our colleagues that we've shared the practice of mindfulness with. And we just enjoy our breathing. We just enjoy uh, our steps. And we don't have to be the one always teaching. So lo local sanghas work in that way. The best sanghas work in that way, is when the facilitator can remove him or herself, or themselves, and the sangha continues and generates peace and joy. So it's not dependent on one person, but it's a community of practice. And that's the way we, we practice to be in Deer Park as well, in the monastic community. 2,600 years has been like that. Of course, sometimes there's one teacher who is very prominent, but the spirit of the monastic path is uh, the spirit of community. And we try to transmit that to schools. So the teachers also feel that spirit and they see, they don't see themselves as an individual in opposition to their colleagues, but rather as, as a, um, water, drops of water flowing together as a river, going in the same direction. And so supporting one another in the path of um, mindfulness and healing. So those are uh, three principles that we teach in the educators' retreats and that we are covered in the book. In that retreat in 2014, you can watch it online, it's very beautiful. You have to put it in French to see it. There's a point where Tai says that a, a real practitioner knows how to generate a feeling of joy, a feeling of happiness, wherever they are, whenever. And then Tai repeats it. A real practitioner knows how to generate a feeling of joy. And Tai almost jumps out of his wheelchair to say it so emphatically. Tai had a, 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 because of the mini stroke, Tai already had trouble speaking. So you can tell 
in his voice. He just wants to transmit that. <laughs> it's so key. Um, Thai suffering as a young monk in Buddhism was that he saw many of the monks around him were not very joyful. They didn't know. And it's not because they were bad monks. But somehow through, this, through uh, many centuries and the way the, the structure of the institutions of Buddhism grow, then people can get titles and positions, but they actually don't know how to generate joy and happiness. The fundamental teaching of the Buddha. They know a lot about Buddhism, but they cannot generate joy. And, uh, and the same is true for teachers. Um, teachers can learn a lot about their subject, but they're not actually happy. And so the students wonder, why am I in this class? It's so boring. <laughs> it's not that it's boring, it's because it's, yeah, there's, there's a spark that's missing. And that spark is a joy. So it may have been that teacher had some joy, but somehow it's been lost in grading papers and parent-teacher conferences and and new certifications and standardized testing and administration and administrative duties and all of these things just weigh so heavily on the teacher that they lost the spark. So I really want to emphasize this point that we need to come back to ourselves and learn how to generate joy wherever we are, whenever we are. I know that I don't always... Uh, feel joyful all the time, <laughs> but I feel joyful a lot of the time. And what I'm sure of is that I know how to generate joy. Sometimes I'm a bit, mm, I don't feel like generating joy. <laughs> but I know that I can do it. I know that I've been able to train myself and I know how to create the conditions for joy to manifest. And I learn to strengthen that capacity every day. So that, that is a, the, the point. We can... We may not be a full-time Buddha, but we can be a part-time Buddha. <laughs> and, but the key is knowing how to generate joy. It means we don't depend on things outside of ourselves to experience joy, like uh, sense pleasures, or uh, you know, thinking about the future or the past. But in the present moment, just by being aware of our body, aware of our feelings, aware of our mind, we can generate joy. That's the key. And then we are learning, we're cultivating that capacity. We're on the path to do it. That is the most important thing. That's what Titus wants to repeat over and over again. But we'd be get very bored if he just said that over and over again in the Dhamma talk. <laughs> so, so Tai has to teach about this aspect of the Dhamma and that aspect and this sutra and that one. But in the core of it is that. <laughs> this is the core. Transforming our suffering into joy and happiness. That's the key. So, so he, he emphasized that for the teachers. Another radical proposition that Tai brought to the teacher-student relationship is the practice of deep listening. And I have to say that talking to some teachers in the compilation of this book, they, some of them found it quite even dangerous <laughs> to sit as a teacher with your student and share your suffering and be able to listen to the suffering of the students. The teacher and the students can apply the practices of mindful listening and speaking in sharing sessions. They need to listen to each other first. The teacher should be able to sit down and listen to the suffering of the students. And the students can come to know the difficulties and the suffering of the teacher and of their fellow students. After they have listened like this, their behavior will change the whole class can practice sitting down, breathing, and listening to each other. 
This is not a waste of time. On the contrary, it leads to mutual understanding. Students and teachers will be able to collaborate with each other in making the learning and teaching a joy for both. Let's imagine a teacher sitting down with a student to talk about the suffering of that young person. The teacher has developed the capacity to listen with compassion and help the student to suffer less. Until now, there may have been no one who could understand the suffering of that person. His father and mother are so busy, and because of that, this young person is so angry. Now, as a teacher, we have a chance to sit down and listen to his suffering. The teacher may be the first person who knows how to sit down and listen to him. If the young person feels that his suffering is understood by someone, he will suffer less. So the practice of compassionate listening helps connect the teacher with the student, builds trust, and removes the anger and fear between teacher and students. When I read this passage, I remember a teacher I had in high school. And uh, that teacher, Mrs. Masaryk, taught Spanish. And, and as a gift to the class, she organized a, a Mexican, like kind of Tex-Mex food day. And with the help of one or two students, the, they brought food, like I think we ate burritos or something in the class one day. And, and then it was very lovely. And then uh, the next day when we came into the class, uh, she, at the beginning of the class, she shared her suffering with us. After she had put all this effort into making this uh, food available for our class, no one had thanked her. And she had to clean up as well after the students. And I remember we all sat there and we were very terrified. <laughs> I, I felt, oh gosh. And, we, and I think all of us, we felt, we didn't feel angry or anything. We felt very, uh, a little bit guilty. But we, main thing, the main thing was that we felt her suffering and we realized, wow, we were not very grateful for what we, not only what we received the day before, but also what she offered to us throughout the year. And we just sat there like we were being forced to do this, to listen in class and learn. So it was a big wake-up call for me as a high school student not to take for granted what a teacher offers. Uh, there's another story. Uh, when I was in college, I was taking multivariable calculus. I don't know why. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> I ended up being an English major. <laughs> but for some reason, I was taking multivariable calculus and learning that, uh, that the other students in college were much better than the other students in high school <laughs> at, at uh, math. And one day, the, the teacher, who's really a math genius, had filled the whole board with a proof. It took about more than 30 minutes to go through every step of that mathematical proof. And when he reached the QED, right, quad arum demonstratum, something like that, <laughs> at the end, he took a step back and then he looked at the whole proof. And we were, had all been scribbling down furiously, you know, everything that he said and the proof. And then he turned to us and he said, I need to make a deep apology to all of you. I made a mistake in the proof. And I've just wasted your time for half an hour. And you deserve more than this. And I remember like, being blown away <laughs> by the, the honesty and the integrity of that professor. 
that he could have somehow talked his way around it, maybe, and said, oh, well, actually, this is a, you know, see where his mistake is and kind of make it as if he hadn't done it. But to really own it in front of all of us and share his mistake, I felt so, it stayed with me until now. I always remember that how to be truly authentic and honest. When you make a mistake, you have to share it. And I, I must admit, I'm not always capable of doing it. <laughs> Some part of me wants to just erase over it and then <laughs> you know, do it right without, hoping nobody notices. But uh, then I remember that professor that day and how I, my, I think all of us, our respect went way up for him because, of course, all of us make mistakes. And the, the proof was incredibly complicated. <laughs> I, I didn't understand it completely. I was just trying to absorb it through osmosis. So I didn't see the mistake. But uh, he, you know, he, he did that. So that is, that's an example, I think, of what Tai is saying. When a teacher is able to share their suffering, to be really authentic of where their shortcomings are and share that with the students. And the students feel respect because they feel like uh, it's not just a show, it's not entertainment. It's like you want to, we want to get at the truth, we want to understand. And in order to understand, we need to understand each other and that we're all human and that we make mistakes. So those are two concrete examples from my own life that I, I always remember in this. Uh, when I read this part of the passage. And I know that Tai as well has made mistakes. <laughs> and he's able to share it with his students. And in the Vietnam he grew up in, that would be almost unthinkable. Somehow the, the high venerable, if they make some mistake, it's just, we just find a way, even if the students find a way to make it seem like it's not there. We just er try to erase it and then continue on and hope that hope for the best. And so much suffering can be um, buried because of that. So Tai wants to also transform that aspect of Buddhism. I remember as a um, novice monk, we celebrated, we actually, we just had Thanksgiving here. We actually celebrated Thanksgiving in France because there were a lot of Americans at that time that came to Plum Village. And so somehow it had become part of the culture. And Tai, tai shared this beautiful, um, in this ceremony, kind of being that we had for Thanksgiving, shared his gratitude towards his students. It was so heartfelt and real. That tai, and, and I was just a, one of Tai's very young student, new students then. So I, I, it was not so much that I felt it towards myself, but I felt, oh my gosh, this teacher. You know, all of the students, these great monks and nuns that are my elder brothers and sisters, and Tai is expressing his gratitude to them because Tai knows that he cannot do what he's doing without them. When we... Uh, when Tai would go on tour and the whole Sangha would sit on the stage in mindfulness during the whole talk. I just thought that's something that we do. But actually, who does that? I realized only Tai. <laughs> it's very powerful. And when we sit up there, it's something so powerful is conveyed that is not is beyond the words that Tai uses that we sit up there, we have so much trust in Thai. I never had any um, feeling like, no, I don't want to sit up there next to Thai. I, and it, neither did it feel like a, like a kind of pride to sit up there, but it just felt like completely authentic, completely like, I have trust in this teacher and what Thai will say, and I can sit here without any reservation because Tai is teaching the Dhamma, and the Dhamma is uh, what is in my heart. And so 
by sitting up here, I'm just contributing to this collective experience. So that, is, for me, is a kind of trust that Tai is talking about here. Kind of trust that can come up between teacher and student if we practice wholeheartedly. Not just teacher and student, but also between spiritual uh, practitioners, between friends on the path. When we have that feeling of, um, yeah, we can really, we can trust one another enough to share when there's a little bit of food stuck on your face. <laughs> that we won't get like angry and embarrassed when you point it out, but feel gratitude. It's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one way you can say somebody's really you know, on the path with you. It's like, when you, did you ever have that happen when you came back and you looked at the mirror and you realized you had a piece of food on your face and nobody told you? I feel like, gosh, you guys are my friends. <laughs> you gotta tell me when I have a piece of food on my face. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not real, right? I mean, that's how we take care of each other. So that's the spirit I feel that Tai is trying to cultivate in the classroom so that we can reconnect. When we look in American society and see all this polarization, you know, it's, it's, uh, the school is one place where that trust can be reestablished. And so much trust has been frayed in the collective or in the, the mass consciousness from school shootings. I mean, in my own hometown, Newtown, Connecticut, um, the place where I played soccer, Sandy Hook School. <laughs> you know, to think that a young man would go in and shoot you know, more than 20 people is just unthinkable when I was growing up, that, that the trust could be frayed to such an extent that a young person could, could feel so disconnected from his the own town that he lived in, that he could do such a thing. So these are the kind of things, I mean, it's just one example amongst many. Um, that we, we don't trust each other so much that we feel we need to have Firearms, guns, automatic weapons, this kind of thing. It's very painful to look at, but it's there. So we need to look at it, especially here in the American society. And so Tai's deep wish is to reestablish trust, trust. And he sees the way through the schools. If we can create spaces of listening, of... Um, space where we can share our suffering as teachers with the students and that trust rebuilds itself. I know, I, I feel very fortunate. Um, I had many good teachers and I have so much trust for those teachers. Um, when we had the wake-up retreat online a few years ago, I facilitated a group of young men in our wake-up retreats. We've recently had usually three groups on one of the afternoons of the retreat. So one group for young men, one for young women, and one for um, LGBTQIA+, or non-binary friends. So kind of rainbow group. And that's been very healing spaces for people. Sometimes they could not share things in other spaces that they could share there. And I remember one young man in my group saying that he felt, as a young man, he didn't see any men that he could admire or respect. And I felt, oh, I felt so... Like, it, it touched me very deeply. And it's not, it's not good for society. <laughs> it's not good for the future, you know, our, our future that someone has that kind of perception is really dangerous. We need to have role models, whether male, female, man, woman, non-binary. We need to feel like there's somebody that we can live a life that is full and compassionate and, um, and helpful. 
where we can be of service. If we don't see that, then we become like that young man in my hometown who feels so disconnected. They feel like they are an aberration. And the pain is so great that it drives them to do such horrible deeds. Yeah, I don't pretend to know <laughs> the psychology of that young man, but I can feel the energy of separation. And uh, because the school is a place, can be a place of so much joy and connectedness, somehow it becomes the locus of also this kind of hatred. So that's why I feel Thai um, somehow focused in on schools. It's very interesting. In 2008, when Thai went to India for the last time, he asked the, the Dhamma teacher Shantam Seth there, or the, the Dhamma teacher Shantam Seth asked Thai, what would be the focus of Thai's tour in India? And Thai said, Thai wants to teach to meet with teachers. And so uh, Shantam brought teachers from all over India to the Dune School in Dehradun, many hundreds of teachers. And Thay led a five-day retreat. And that was really the first educator's retreat. <laughs> and from that point on, Thay was hey, just, I don't know, somehow driven by this new purpose of bringing the practice to teachers. Of course it was there before, but somehow from that point it just, it's like there was, it, wake, uh, what became wake-up schools was catalyzed. And then years, uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, and then the biggest retreat that I know of and that Thai gave in the West, 1,300 people, was in Toronto the University of Brock for it, as an educator's retreat. 900 of the, of the participants were teachers. Uh, you can, uh, Walter, who was just here, made a, the first documentary for the community called Happy Teachers Will Change the World, which is, you can watch. It's very beautiful uh, to see the interviews with teachers who, on their retreat and their transformation. So somehow, this movement, I, yeah, I, I, I see that Tai has always been a teacher of teachers. <laughs> He's always very aware that his students are also teachers. Some, some teachers, they might be very happy in their position. They don't want other people to <laughs> get up and teach. But Tai always was aware. From the time I was even a, a, a novice, Tai would push us, you know, all, all of my brothers and sisters, to the front and say, okay, you tell him. When somebody would ask Tai a question, he would push one of us forward and say, answer his question. <laughs> so Tai was training the t teachers all the time. I think his whole life, even in Vietnam, he is very aware that he it's not enough just to be a good teacher ourselves. We need to be a teacher of teachers. <laughs> because there's a, a bottleneck in society. We need so many Dhamma teachers. But in order to be a Dhamma teacher, we need to embody the practice. So, mm, it's not enough to have a lot of knowledge about Buddhism. I remember one retreat in Malaysia and there was a, a nun in our community at that time from Singapore. And Thai taught in English and then uh, it was being, the retreat was being translated into, uh, into Mandarin Chinese because the participants was, spoke Mandarin. And this very prominent translator was brought in from Taiwan. He was an expert in translating for Zen masters. <laughs> and 
we saw already in the first talk that Tai gave, Tai was not happy with the translator. <laughs> of course, I'm sure his Mandarin Chinese was excellent, but somehow the energy was very different. And so Tai called that young nun into, the, into his uh, office or to his room in the hotel. And I was also there, and he said, Tai wants Sister Koi Ni to translate. Tai does not want this man to translate. And she said, no, no, Tai, they paid a lot of money for this translator to come. And he's very, very well known. It's very, it's, it, it would be, um, you know, she didn't say it, but it, she said it in so many ways, he would lose face if, we, if I got up there. I could not get up there while he is there and translate. Tai, said, tai does not care. Tai wants Tai's student to translate. And she said, Tai, but my Chinese is not good enough. I, I can't do this. Tai does not care. If you don't understand something, you can make it up. <laughs> tai said that, I remember. You, even if you get just 60%, because you know Tai's practice and Tai's energy. And that really stuck with me. This, that's embodiment. We don't need to you know, teach the exercises in this book exactly as they are. You know, they're these beautiful pages that we spent a lot of time on. These gray pages, you know, mindful walking in a circle, every step teaches you how to teach it. It's, it's, it's great. We put a lot of time in. You don't have to do it like that. You know, this, it's not dogmatic. It's about the energy. So we have to be, um, as long as we understand, and, and when we've been able to transform our own suffering, that, then we understand how to teach and share the practice. They said, to be a Dhamma teacher, you only, there's only one requirement. You only need to be happy. That's the only requirement to be a Dhamma teacher. <laughs> you can know a lot about Buddhism, everything about Plum Village practice, but you're not happy. And then, how can you be a Dhamma teacher? So that is, a, that is the spirit of Plum Village practice. We, uh, we embody mindfulness practice, and not perfectly, <laughs> but we were on the path. And Tai said many times, the only requirement, to st whether you can stay or not in a practice center, is whether you are practicing. You can suffer a lot, but if you suffer and you don't practice, then you have to leave. So when you suffer, then you have to be open to receive input on how you practice without suffering when you're in a practice center. And then you can stay. But if you say, I don't want to hear, I don't want to <laughs> practice with the community, I, I already have my own understanding. No. <laughs> then, and it has happened sometimes, the community has asked someone to leave. So these are all just ways in which we come back to this original teaching that I started with, which is the way out is in. Learning how to go into ourselves. And then when we do that, then the practice becomes easy and it becomes easier to relate to people. Because you don't feel this kind of separation between what you're experiencing in yourself, your, your, your suffering inside, and what's going on outside. You see that 99.999% you know, of our DNA is the same. <laughs> and we are all related. I think you can trace back to about 2000 BC. So everyone living today has a common ancestor. Is it, maybe it's everyone outside of Africa, I think, has a common because, of course, uh, some, um, ethnic, some lines which were uh, never, as far as we know, outside, out of Africa. <laughs> I think that's right. Is everyone outside of, in the diaspora of Homo sapiens outside of Africa, everyone has a common ancestor about 2000 BC. <laughs> 
So we're all deeply interrelated. And uh, we can then be relatively sure that our suffering is like the suffering of the other person. If not, then the Buddha, what would have been the purpose of the Buddha's awakening? <laughs> how could we benefit? If our suffering had nothing to do with the Buddha's suffering, how could we experience the joy from learning the Dhamma? But because the Buddha had that insight that there, we are not separate self, then he knew that his body could be his own laboratory. And he could be the scientist at once as the laboratory. And subject and object become one. <laughs> as we learned in the other classes, that we don't behave like a scientist who is separate from his experiment, just observing and think that they have nothing to do with each other. But the observation is one with the subject. Subject and object are one. So our body is the laboratory, our body is also the subject. <laughs> and that is the spirit of the four foundations of mindfulness. Experiencing the body in the body. Experiencing the feelings in the feelings. So it's, we don't separate, make body an object. Too long in the West we've separated this body and soul. And we treat them as two separate things. Now I go to the hospital to take care of my physical body, and then I go to the psychologist to take care of my, my mind. <laughs> and we treat them as separate, and that has created so much suffering. So we need to learn to reintegrate. And so this, when I discovered in, when I was 24, the four foundations of mindfulness was such an awakening, contemplating the body in the body, not looking at a book of anatomy, not imagining what I've learned about the body in my head, but actually experiencing it through direct insight, what they call interoception, right? Our capacity to know, for example, when we're hungry, that we're hungry, that our heart is beating, that we need to breathe more deeply. This is all these physiological states in our body, they call interoception, the capacity to observe them and change. When we're thirsty, how do we know we're thirsty? <laughs> so these are all things that are brought under the more modern term, interoception. It's having a perception inside of what's going on inside of ourselves. So by the Buddha already had that insight. Body in the body. So I need to be aware of my body just as it is. Not as I imagine it to be or I want it to be but just as it is, my ribs, my flesh, my heart, I can experience it, I do a scan of my body. And the same with then feelings, extending it to our pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neutral feelings. Just being aware, wow, the sea of feelings which is always changing. And then you don't have fear so much a painful feeling because you see that it's just temporary. Even now, I, I find myself reminding myself, oh, I'll have a little bit of, you ever have like a feeling and it's just like, it seems like so horrible, but it's, you, you realize it only happens for five seconds. But in that moment, like, it's like the bottom drops out and you feel like nothing matters and nothing is important. And then five seconds later, you smile. It's like, what just happened there? But in that moment, it's like, whew, oh my gosh, there's nothing important. Why am I living? You know, and you feel horrible. It's just a bunch of chemicals going around in your body. But it, you, if you're really in the present moment, you can fully experience, I like to fully experience those moments. Like, wow, what's going on here? Because I know it's impermanent. It's not going to last. But I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what's going on? And if we are, you know, you know, what if we have access to a gun at that moment? So, emotions are not, you know, uh, unimportant. We need to really take care of our emotions. And most of us, we 
we're not going to reach for a gun, but we will say something or do something so hurtful. So if we have the capacity to take care of that emotion as teachers, especially when we're standing in, in a place of authority, so we're very aware. I mean, when, when I stand here as a Dhamma teacher, I'm aware it's not me. It's the Dhamma. So I need to be very, take, take care. One time in Plum Village, there was a Q&A, and we had the whole of the um, family retreat there. Many hundreds of, actually, six, seven hundred people. And there was a question, and I remember the, there's a nun who answered. And uh, I also admit I was not so satisfied by the answer. But I know that in there, there are, some, there are many good things for that person to practice. Maybe it's not directly on the point, as I might share, or one of my other brothers and sisters, or Thai. But in the, the sharing, there are, there are good things. And there was one man in the, in the audience, and he also was not happy with that answer. And so he raised his hands. I would like to answer that question. <laughs> and he started to, you know, he wanted to respond to the question. And I was the one facilitating that Q&A. And I thought, oh, <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> and, I, and I, somehow in that moment, I was able to take the microphone and say, you know, not every answer that you hear up here might be perfect or the best one. I think I said something a little bit more skiffle because the nun was, of course, there. <laughs> but that was the spirit of it. But there is an element of trust because we are here as Dhamma teachers. And we know as a Dhamma teacher, we're taking responsibility for what we say. It means that we're willing to follow it through. I mean, we know that people are going to hear this and they, they might act on it. And actually, that's true for all of us, not just for Dhamma teachers. <laughs> Everything we say has real effects in the world. But especially when you're standing and you have a, you're in a position of authority, you have to be very careful. And so that's what I feel is transmitted when we, re we receive the Dhamma lamp. <laughs> it's the responsibility of the Sangha. So we know that we, take, we have to take responsibility. We cannot just say what, we feel, what occurs to us. We need to know um, and, and, be, and be willing to receive feedback, <laughs> especially from our other monastic brothers and sisters. And it can be quite strong. <laughs> so that's why I, I shared in that way to that man, so he could understand why um, in that moment it was not appropriate for him to, to answer. And people would have different opinions about that. But I, I wanted to protect as well the person asking the question. Because with so many people, and then we just allow everyone to answer, they could be quite, uh, feel violated. Like they had come up there with establishing their trust in the Dhamma teacher body of the Sangha. And now their question is being put out to, to everyone. So it's a little bit delicate when we're, when we're in this position. But it's something that we learn from Thai. Because Thay was very aware when he's here. It's not Thay is not the most important person, but it's the the care, the Dhamma, which is the most important. And uh, yeah, as a, as as a human being, Thay make, might make a mistake, but he knows how to correct it. So just like the math professor, he's willing to admit. One time, Thay. I remember sharing, and it was such a teaching. He had asked uh, one sister to help edit a book, and then Tai asked another sister a little bit later to edit that same book. And the one sister got very mad. The first one asked, got very angry. She said, you are not editing that book. Tai asked me to do it. And it became a conflict. And so Tai apologized in front of the Sangha. Tai didn't remember that he'd asked that sister to edit the book. That's Thay's mistake. So Thay also makes mistakes and is willing to share when the mistake happens. And that is the spirit that, that we should have as a teacher.
And I think that's the spirit that's in this book. So Wake Up Schools is still uh, growing. One of the biggest joys is just to hear from a school. A few years ago, we heard from a school in Mexico, which had implemented the book in every level of the school. I hope it was voluntary and not imposed. <laughs> but we didn't know anyone. I didn't know them, the other brothers and sisters who help with Wake Up Schools. Nobody had heard of anyone in that school or contacted us. They just, just with the book alone, they put it into practice. And this book has not only been used in schools, but also in businesses and many other professions. Uh, because we, uh, we piloted the exercises with many teachers, and I'm not sure any other book had that kind of real life um, feedback. We would take um, Catherine Weir, who's the author of this book, with Thai. She's uh, an expert in social and emotional learning and then became a mindfulness practitioner herself. And we met her on a retreat at the American School of London and she brought a lot, so much expertise, especially in piloting the exercises of the book with teach with teachers. And it's a, it's a wonderful exercise that you can try, which I've used many times that I, I learned from her, which is you, you take one of the chapters, so in here there's um, each chapter there are these gray pages, like I shared, that actually have a, a kind of core practice, how to, with the steps, materials and preparation, and then the steps of learning how to get in touch with our breath. So we'd, we would photocopy those with a group of teachers and we'd pick maybe four chapters, core practices. And they would spend 15 minutes just learning it or reading it by themselves. They would, for, sorry, they would pair up, then spend 15 minutes reading it by themselves, then 15 minutes teaching it to themselves. So if it's inviting the bell, they would have a bell and they would learn how to invite the bell based on what they read here. And then they would get back together in a group, in pairs, and each of them had a different practice in the pair. And one person would teach the other what they had taught themselves, and then the other would teach what they had taught themselves. And then we would get feedback. <laughs> We'd gather them all together, and for each exercise, we would get feedback. This work, they didn't understand this sentence. This could have been better explained. So I think thanks to that kind of method of over a year or two years of working with different teachers groups and piloting the exercises, this book has ended up being useful beyond just schools <laughs> as ways of learning Plum Village practices. Even when I, I heard one of my eldest brothers in Plum Village, Thailand, he told the monks and nuns there, he said, you know, every year you say you can't teach in English. Now you don't have any excuse. It's all in, this, in here. <laughs> I heard that he did that. So the, so the monks and nuns were even using it to learn how to teach uh, in English the practices to, to people on retreats. Okay. I think it's enough for today. Uh, yeah, I encourage you to read, especially, um, well, the notes I tried to put together for this class, the kind of the best of what I felt is in Thay's teaching in the book. It's very lovely as well to read the end part of the book, which really gets into these three pillars of embodiment, service, and community as it concretely manifests in the experience of teachers who contributed to the book. It's very inspiring. Whether you're a teacher or a practitioner or however you see yourself, it's the kind of real world experience of Thais Plum Village practice. Okay, thank you. And I wish you all become happy teachers. Mm -hmm.